All right, we want to honor your time, and also um, Dr. Bishop has a lot to get, get through today, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before um, I turn the mic over to Dr. Bishop. If you've never been in this building before and you need restrooms, um, the men's room is straight out the door, and the women's room is straight out the door and to the left. All right, and there, I, I believe there's some waters out in the hallway as well if you need water um, during this session. So, I have the honor of introducing um, Dr. Peter Bishop today. He's from Houston, and I think he'll talk a little bit about that. But um, the session is, um, is actually called 12 Things You Should Know and 10 Things You Can Do to Anticipate and Influence the Future. It's a little bit different than what's in your, um, in your brochure. I had the honor of listening to um, Dr. Bishop speak earlier this year, so I just want to let you know you're in for a treat. Um, this is a really intriguing topic, so I think you'll all enjoy it. So please help me welcome Dr. Peter Bishop. Good morning to you all. Good to see you here. Always great to be in Tarrant County. Uh, I've been here before, and it's a great, great place and great institution. So this is, uh, you're getting a bonus, you're getting two more things than, uh, than you bargained for. I only do then 10 things when I turned the title in a few months ago, and now I've thought of 12 things. So uh, this is a little bit extra. And uh, if you're interested in getting the presentation, you don't have to write this down now, but if you want to get it later on, this is the, uh, uh, the link there. You can have that and use it for non-commercial purposes. I certainly encourage you to share it with your employees, with your students, uh, with uh, organizational members, uh, whatever, because uh, we are in a period of time, uh, came up last uh, session about the rate of change, the amount of change, and particularly the amount of disruptions that we're experiencing in the present era. It is significantly more than it was before, and as a result, uh, our argument is that we have to think about the future differently. Uh, we, we never took, you probably never took a course on the future in your, all of your education. I certainly did. I was interested, I was a sociologist, I got my degrees in sociology, I was interested in social change. And they didn't even cover much of social change, that's a whole different uh, lecture, but uh, they didn't cover the future. I didn't even know there was a study of the future until I was interviewing for a job at the University of Houston Clear Lake, which is a new UH campus down by the Johnson Space Center. And I was interviewed by the dean, who's, uh, and, and towards the end of lunch, uh, I had read the catalog, <laughs> obviously, and found this degree called Studies of the Future. And I said, what is this Studies of the Future? And I was a scientific sociologist, so I had kind of skepticism. And he said, well, we study the past, don't we? I said, yeah. Why can't we study the future? Well, I had a lot of reasons why you couldn't study something that didn't exist. Come on now. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I kept to myself <laughs> all of those reasons, got the job, and stumbled on a university, the first university in the world that offered a degree in future studies. I, could, I like to say there are more today than there were then. It's not a whole lot more, but some more. And uh, I was, uh, after teaching statistics there for six or seven years, I moved over into that futures program, uh, started teaching in it, and eventually, over 30 years, truly crafted it into a program that I'm so, far, so very proud of. We are graduating uh, professional futurists and foresight professionals to help people in preparing for and indeed for influencing the future. Those are the two big functions, anticipating what is coming and influencing what is coming are the two big things. On the other hand, uh, when, I, when I graduated, I, think, I keep saying graduated, retired in 2013, <laughs> finally my first year out of school since I was four years old, uh, I, when I retired and happily turned it over to my colleague who's doing a great job running the program, I don't golf and I don't fish. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do and my wife was still working so she certainly didn't want me around. She said, well, if this is for better or for worse or not for lunch. So um, the, uh, I, I decided to take that passion that I had for teaching the future to graduate students, uh, to adults in our certificate program, and public speaking, corporate seminars, and things like that, and informing and talking to the one group that had not yet been touched by the future, and those are the young people in our society, the students in our middle schools, in our high schools, in our colleges, if anybody ought to be educated about how to anticipate and influence the future. It is them. And it is nothing going on there. Almost nothing. 
And so my job now, created Teach the Future, created a job for myself. It's a nonprofit which is trying to bring futures thinking to uh, colleges and high schools and middle schools. I'm working with the people here at Terry County. We're going to have our first faculty seminar on teaching the future here in February. And uh, we hope to be able to embed this kind of thinking into the, into the curriculum here as a leading organization that's being able to do this. We're also working with some school districts. Uh, it's all very, very slow, but there's some progress being made. So what are we going to teach them about the future? Well, there is, I, I, I like to tell people that you don't have to be a futurist to understand the future, to deal with the future in, a, in an effective and systematic way. You don't have to be an accountant to know how to balance your checkbook, how to save money for retirement, uh, what your interest payment is going to be on your credit cards or on your house or your car. Those are part of what has now come to be called financial literacy. Now, we should have been teaching that a long time ago, too. <laughs> and so maybe we might not have had a housing crisis and all that's a different story. But um, this is something else. So it's not necessary to be a futurist. And yet, frankly, I had been teaching people, students, young students, the process. We're about to publish a book on the process of coming up with alternative futures and, 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 and preferred futures. And I realized, wait a minute, they don't have to know the process. They just have to know what the outcome of the process is. What is it that they want? So this is, frankly, a brand new presentation. You can leave now if you, you, know, if you think you need to. I was thinking when I were taught a new course, they got the benefit of enthusiasm over experience. So you can get that too here. So I said, excerpting out from what I knew, what would I teach a general audience? It was not the process of doing future studies, but things that they should know in. So that's, that's the way we go. I'm going to ask a question, sometimes a silly question, sometimes a rhetorical question, and I will give you what I think my answer is to that question is, and then talk about some examples. You have a little sheet there if you want to keep track of the examples that you come up with, the examples that I've come up with. Uh, we can uh, go through the process there. So this is audience participation. Definitely want this to be more like a class than it's just a straight stand up. So let's talk about 12 things that you should know about the future. How many futures are there? How many futures are there? One, three, what? Excuse me? It depends. It depends. Well, no, it doesn't. No. How many futures are there? But think of an answer in your own mind. If somebody asks you, you know, if your seven, 10 year old said, How many futures are there, Dad? Okay, infinite and one. Those are the two, that's the, <laughs> the two uh, ends there. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> one, and so a lot of people, unless people say one today, we're getting a little bit of an influence. Infinite is really hard to handle. What we say is that there are many, many futures out there. Now that's kind of obvious. Many things could happen. It's possible that we could be this and that and the other thing. But when you get into the infinite, Oh my gosh, things become kind of difficult to deal with. So therefore, we tend not to deal with the infinite. Rather, the images of a river delta. How many ways does a river get to a larger body of water? How many ways does the Nile or the Mississippi get to the seas that they empty into? It's a countable number of ways. It's not an infinite number, but there are more ways than one. And frankly, the most profound change of mind about the future that I can share with you is to radically believe there is more than one future, more than one plausible outcome. Unfortunately, not by direct instruction, but by implication, we are led to believe that our job in dealing with the future is to find out what the future is going to be. It's even part of our language. We talk about the future. In fact, it's hard to say the futures. Now, we called our degree Futures Studies, which is kind of, a, 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 you know, it's hard to say that. And the futures, and what's, you know, tell me about the futures, which is absolutely correct, but it sounds wrong. Because in every other subject in our, uh, in, in our schooling, we were, what was our purpose? To get the right answer. What was our purpose to put that answer on the test and get a good grade? If that was in science class, in math class, 
in history class, even in many ways in, in literature, in, 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 in literature, there was a right answer out there and that our job was to find that. So when we come to the future, for which we got no instruction whatsoever, we apply that same kind of thinking. There must be a right answer out there. There must be a future out there. And getting over that is one of the fundamental barriers to thinking about the future in this novel way so that we can manage the future as it is today. At, before, the rate of change was slower. That one future was more apparent. And today it's becoming less and less apparent as we are dealing with multiple, multiple alternatives. So it's hard to really see it until you see it. People say, what do you think is going to happen? And I say, here are the choices. I never, ever give a single answer. I don't think of what's going to happen. I think that there are alternatives out there. And that's continually what we're doing. So one of the first things in mindset, in terms of your business, in terms of your employees and your colleagues and, and, and your families even, what are the alternatives? Are we preparing and are we influencing what those alternatives are? One way of putting it is that the, what we are taught in school or implied and taught in school is to always give the predictable future. What's the data? Where are the trends going? What are the experts saying is going to happen? What is the most likely consensus forecast? We hear that all the time. And that's a real future. I'm not discounting that. But it is not the only future, because oftentimes something else happens instead. And the more we believe in the predictable future, the more surprised we are with the alternative futures, with the random factors, the things that happen that we don't expect. And the more surprised we are, surprise is a wonderful thing. Surprise is a human emotion. I mean, if you like horror movies, which I don't, there's a lot of surprise there. There's a lot of surprise at the, at the carnival. There's a surprise birthday party, whatever. Those are surprises that we like. Thank you very much. This has really been fun. But the surprises in business are not so much fun because we tend to not be prepared. And therefore, we tend to be at risk. And so can we predict surprise? Well, that's, that's an inconsistency. If you're going to be surprised, you obviously couldn't predict it. But can we prepare for surprise nevertheless? Can we think about things seriously and deeply, about things that might occur that don't occur? And people say, well, why waste your time? They're not going to occur anyway. Some of them are. And therefore, we get into a habit of thinking about alternatives. I think of it as intellectual calisthenics. It's not, it's not physical calisthenics, but jogging. Jogging, notice, it's not transportation. You don't get anywhere. You end up right where you started. But you're in shape. You're in condition. So thinking about alternative futures is not multiple predictions. It's getting in shape to prepare for a future which we may be surprised or may be unexpected. So it's a flexibility of mind, not locking ourselves in to that one future which we think is going to occur, also realizing that there are always, always, always multiple futures out there. So we think of the future as three different kinds of futures. The expected future, which is where we're headed. If you draw a line through the trends today, you'll get somewhere. And that's the expected future. If nothing surprising happens and all our assumptions turn out to be exactly as we expect them, then that's where we'll end up. That is a potential future. It's probably the most probable future. Well, it's not very probable in and of itself. There are alternative futures, other futures that could occur. And then finally, there is the future that we want to occur, the preferred future. Which of these should we choose? All we should do. Know the expected, consider the alternatives, and choose the preferred. And that becomes both our navigational device and the basis for decision. So the next time the argument breaks out, which is the right future, try and call off of that. Whoa, stop. That's not a useful thing to say. There are alternatives out there, and we should consider them. If there's plausibility, if there's some evidence for them, we should consider them all. So that's item number one. The first thing you should know about the future. The alternative on your sheet, of course, is that elections, sporting outcomes, World Series, go, go Astros, thank you, <laughs> is, um, it's, they're the alternatives are obvious. They're not so obvious oftentimes in business. Sometimes the expected future is what we also prefer, but may not be likely. 
the alternative futures oftentimes are not, we don't prepare enough for them, we don't think about them, because it is inefficient. Jogging is inefficient. You don't get anywhere and you take time away from work or playing with your kids or, or whatever, sleep. But it is a conditioning exercise. So imagining alternative futures is part of it. So the future is not one, it is many. That's our first. And you have in your experience examples of futures that could turn out differently. And every single business, every single organization, every single professional career has those in their future. And they should be on the table, explicit. Now, we're not spending a whole lot of time gazing at them, but we should be ready to deal with them. Where does the future come from? Who creates the future? Where does the future come from? Quick answer. Anybody want to take a shot at that? It's two places. Yeah. The future comes from the world, and it comes from ourselves. It is a combination, a reciprocal interaction. The world is going on changing, and I don't know how powerful you are, but you don't have much to say about that. You sit down at a card table, you dealt a hand, that's your hand. You can't say, I don't want it, I don't want that one, I want a different one. No, no, that's your hand, you have to play your hand. So the, the, the dealer is part of your future at that in that game, and you are part of the future of that game. It is all how we play for it. So the problem in our culture, I think, particularly in business culture, is that we spend a lot of time on what we're going to do and how we're going to influence the future and be entrepreneurs and, and be successful in that. We don't spend enough time paying attention to the world. We're kind of making an assumption that the world is going to kind of stand pat. It's not really going to change all that much. And we're, therefore, we're surprised. My gosh, I got there and you know the, the market changed or the technology changed and we didn't expect that. So always being, now sometimes, our influence is paramount. Choosing your career, choosing your education, choosing where you go to work. You're more important than that than the world is. But the marketplace, the interest rate, the regulations and laws, you know, we have a vote. But that's not going to change very much. And that is uh, the future. The, the world is dominant in those cases. So we have to be always ready to be thinking about, and by the same token, the world doesn't determine our life. Even if we do nothing, that's also allowing the world to, to dictate to us. So we're always trying to balance these two forces. The world is changing, we can change, we can create change, and where is all that going to come from? So that should be a discussion within every enterprise in the next one, three, five years. What's the world changing? How is it changing? And what are we going to do about it to become successful? Now that's not, that's not operations. That's not the job. The job, 90% of our, every job is operations. But I'll talk about later on. You ought to have some time set aside to consider these larger and longer term possibilities. That's just protection. So how fast does it come here? How fast does the future arrive? Answers? Two again? <laughs> it comes fast and it comes slow. There is a slow motion move to the future, those what we call trends, climate change, demographic change, usually economic change. Those are changing the future and over the long run they will have substantial changes and substantial, the, the future will be different as a result. But they come very slowly, it, we call it incremental or continuous change. And those are real things, and we can get data on those things. We can chart out, you know, that's that's a, that's the continuous change, and the, and we like that continuous change because a we can measure it, we can put it in a spreadsheet, we can extrapolate it out and get numbers for next year or two years from now. It gives us a kind of a comfort that we know what's going on in the future until, and what they say is that every trend continues until it doesn't, and those are disruptions, those are events. And the events that we have experienced since the, uh, since the 1970s have been significant. These events act as bookends to a period we call an era. We learned from history. Depression was an era. 
So the Cold War was an era. The Renaissance was an era. They began with an event, and they end with an event. event obviously, the Depression began with the crash in 1929 and ended with the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1940. The Cold War begins with the nuclear weapons in uh, 19, the Russians with nuclear weapons in 1947 and ends with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Some of those are very well demarcated, some are not. But there's a, there's a kind of a, a period of time when thing, we kind of understand things. And the more we're in them, the more we understand them. It's our time. It's our era. Guess what? We're in an era today. We don't know the name of our era because historians of the future haven't named us yet. But our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will study our time the way we study the times of our grandparents and great-grandparents and ancestors way back. And they will know us in a way that is different. We know us at the CNN USA Today level, you know, the Facebook level. They're not going to know us at that level. They're going to know us at the big picture level. What's the big story going on today? What are we going to, what are we doing or not doing? they will read about in history books. And that's a perspective that we also need to know today. Now, we, don't, we do need to come up with current events and all that kind of stuff. But once in a while, we need to kind of raise our head above that screen and say, what's really happening? What is going on? What's the era that we're in? When did it start? And more importantly, how might it end? And when it ends, we're going to have to make a change in business, in professional life, in family life, or whatever. And so it, there's a dual recommendation here. Use the current era. Use the current rules and formulas and, and formulas for success as they are going on today, but don't get too wedded to them. Don't get that what, call, what I call the white knuckle grip on the present. Get ready to let it go. Now, that will be a judgment call. When is the time? When do we really need to change? When and how deep for that change needs to be. That's all a matter of intense discussion. But again, protect some time. When is this era going to change? How are we going to adapt? And what's going to be the change of that? So think about your own business or your own career. What were the eras? Your leadership, your markets, your business approach, your technologies. If you've been in that era for some time, you're pretty comfortable. Presumably, you're being successful. It's fine. Frankly, the longer you are in that era, however, the more likely you are to be disrupted. Entrepreneurs are beginning a new era. New entrepreneurs. They're, at, they're, they're just being disrupted every week. <laughs> so they're not in an era. They're turbulent, going on, going on, going on. But once you get it right, and you move into success, growth, and, and stability, it is so easy to say, oh, we have this figured out. We now know how to do this. And frankly, what will happen in most businesses, you will keep doing it longer than you should. You will not be ready to say, here's change, and we need to adapt. So that is, so we get the, we get the future wrong. There was a study done of, uh, uh, of people, uh, the science, it was published in Science Magazine, scientific survey, asked people to describe the past. And then ask people to describe the future. And their descriptions were entirely different. The past was all the events that they learned in history class. The Civil War, the Napoleonic Era, the building of the railroads, all of those kinds of things. There were trains back there, but we didn't study them. I don't know about your history class. We didn't study many, very many of those. We studied the events, the interesting stuff, where the story is. The stories are made out of events. Then they asked them to, to, to describe the future. What was missing? Events. It was all trends. It was kind of a you know upwardly slope of more computers and more people and more climate change and there were no events out there. The reason being, you can't know what the events will be, and in our culture, you can't open your mouth unless you can prove what you say. And so, what we're offering is an antidote to the belief that the present is basically and the present trends are basically going to go on forever. Now, you don't believe that, but frankly, implicitly, that's the way we act. We generally do not, are not allowed to talk about events that we can't pin down with a date and a, and a, and a time and, a, and implications and things like that. So we're going, that's another way, that's another thing you should know about the future. Think about events that don't 
may not yet occur. We'll get into that in a moment. So the future is wrong if it's just trends, but the events of the past. And what would be in the, those blanks in the future? What could be? Not what will be, because we don't know what will be, but what could be. And is it worth considering what could be as, again, an exercise in living in a world that is not our own world? Living in an era that we're not in. Now, we are asked oftentimes in history class to imagine ourselves in the colonial period, in you know, the Middle Ages, or whatever. And, and whether we can do skits and students are exercised in terms of how would it be different then. What we're never asked to do is imagine ourselves in a different future. Well, we're not talking about the future at all, so clearly not that. Wouldn't that be an exercise that would help students realize that the future that they think is going to occur has some probability of occurring? It's not wrong, but it's incomplete. And there are these other futures out there. And that's what we're trying to do with Teach the Future, is bringing that kind of thinking to you as adults and to students before they form up in their mind that you have to have you have to be able to prove what those events will be before you're allowed to talk about it. So we're trying to correct that misimpression that the present era will essentially go on forever. Herbert Stein was an economic advisor to Richard Nixon, and among many of the things he did, he came up with this famous phrase, and that is, uh, trends that can't go on forever won't. Now, it took an economist to tell me that? Okay, well, all right, but that's true. If this can't continue, it won't continue. Now, when is it going to stop? We don't know. How is it going to stop? We don't know. But it's going to stop sometime. So remember, it's mining the present, but keeping an eye on the horizon in case it's time to move. It's, it's, it, you have to keep both of these things going. We can't leave the present aside because we have to keep business and keep our doors open. But we can't leave the horizon aside because that's where change is going to come for us. So it's, it's both of those lines at the same time. Is it headed somewhere? Yes, we are headed somewhere. We are headed to a future which, if there are no surprises, and if the, all our assumptions about how the future is going to emerge, it is a road. But it's not a road that stays a road. It's a road also that turns into a river delta or a fork and branch in peace. Is it guaranteed to occur? Of course not. We know that intellectually. But rarely do we actually take action on it. Rarely do we think about alternative futures seriously. Because that wasn't what we learned in school, and that wasn't, and we say, why should we think about it? That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And frankly, every single one of those alternatives, from a statistical point of view, is less probable than the expected future. The expected future is the single most probable future of all of them. And therefore, people say, well, gee, we'll just think about where we're headed, and we'll make our market plan, we'll make our business plan, based on the assumption that the expected future will come out. And there's some reasonableness to that. Let me give you an example, however, at the casino, when you roll a pair of dice, what's the most common combination of those dice that come up? What's the number that comes up more often than any other number? Seven. Seven. You know what the probability of getting a seven is? One out of six. So all of the others together are more probable than the seven. Any one of them is less, but together something is going to happen other than the seven. So should we say, and this is what in the intelligence world, as I've done some, some work with intelligence analysts and that, give us your best estimate. Make the call is the way they put it. Tell us, tell me what's going to happen in Iraq. Tell me what's going to happen in Russia. Tell me what's going to happen in North Korea. I hope they're not doing that as much as they used to. But it was, I don't have time for all of this complexity. Just tell me what you think is going to happen. And that is the more probable, most probable future. But it's one out of six. You want to make important decisions on a one out of six, a five out of six probability you're going to be wrong? Of course not. You need to consider what the alternative is. Even though it sounds inefficient, it is in the long run more efficient than charging ahead with assumptions that are unexamined and we haven't really looked at in how they make. So it is a river belt. We're in a small boat heading down the Mississippi River. 
had the chance to drive a crew boat off the Mississippi Delta one summer. It was a lot of fun. And if that's a powerful river. And if you just put the paddle down and let the boat float, you'll go down one of those. The world will have determined what it is. If you want to choose one, you can do that. But you have to start paddling. You have to start directing yourself towards that alternative future before you get there. You can't paddle up the river. You can't go sideways. The river's carrying you forward. So you have to look ahead, look at what all the alternatives are, and make your choices before those alternatives become apparent in your face. Because if they become apparent in your face, then it's too late. So thinking about making choices and picking among alternatives and preparing for alternative futures before they are on the doorstep. And very people, very many people prefer not to do that. We'll wait till that becomes a problem. Uh, I attended a meeting, a very senior analyst with CIA gave a talk there. He was allowed to talk in general about a briefing that he gave to people in the, in the establishment called the principals. Secretaries of Defense, State, Director of CIA, those kinds of things. And his point was, and this was 10 years ago, before the Arab Spring, the regime in Egypt is under tremendous pressure and it will collapse. <coughs> That's pretty important. Tell us when they're going to collapse within the next two or three weeks. <laughs> That's what they, I, don't, I can't deal with that now. I'm not dealing with that now. Tell us when it's imminent. And, and then we will do something about it. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. We will have no new information before it occurred. It occurred three years later. When, when do you know when the, the dams have got cracks in it? When it's going to break? The bridge, when it's going to collapse? It has the cracks now. Well, it's okay. It's don't you know? It's, you know, it's, it's going to hold up for a while. I'm going to be retired by the time it collapses. It's okay. There's no problem. We do not tend to want to use. And listen to this. It's reasonable. We don't want to use current resources. Take current resources away from current benefits or operations, things that we know they're useful for today, to do preventive maintenance, to take care of problems that are only possibilities. When we wait for those things to become real problems, we're going down one of those tubes of the river and it's too late. And we're then trying to play catch up. So it is something else may happen instead. There is a certain element. How many futures are there? An infinite number? Many. Many. How many can we really deal with? We certainly can't deal with an infinite number. We can deal with a hundred. We couldn't deal with fifty. But Here's the rule here. Not every future is possible, but not every future is plausible. Plausible futures are those that have a measurable probability of actually occurring. And how do we know what's plausible versus possible? It's possible we could have the aliens landing on the White House lawn even as this talk is going on. That's possible, but it's not plausible. What's plausible? Plausible is that we have some evidence. We don't prove it, because it's expected future we have all the evidence for. But we have some evidence that actually it could occur. And I'll talk about what that evidence may be. It's very similar to the speech we all get when we are called for jury duty. We get a speech by the, the, the attorneys there. The difference between doubt, this criminal trial, and reasonable doubt. And our standard is, for jury trials, for criminal trials, the, the, the jury has to find reasonable doubt. There is always doubt. I mean, that person sitting there, accused by the prosecution, could well be innocent. Always possible. Always possible. But if you, unless you come up with a reason for reasonable, you have to convict that person of the charge they're guilty. And if you find a reason, that it was brother, or it was he was in a different location, or if there is evidence, remember, evidence in the trial that there is an alternative explanation for his guilt, then by law, the jury is required to find him <coughs> not guilty. Not innocent, but not guilty. That's the difference between possible and plausible. What's plausible? We have some reasonable belief 
that this may not occur. So, in this case, we have no reasonable belief that aliens are on the way. There's no evidence, there's possibilities, but there's no evidence that that's going to happen. So we don't consider that very serious. We have a lot of reasonable belief that self-driving vehicles and autonomous vehicles will become, in fact, not just reasonable, they're the expected future. Everybody's preparing for that. Uber, Ford, Nissan are all developing the technology Google started it all with for autonomous vehicles. That's the expected future, but if you're thinking like a futurist, you're saying, wait a minute, the expected future is not guaranteed. What could happen? What is reasonable to believe that might put the autonomous vehicles off the table? The aliens could come and eliminate our Well, you are, you are a futuristic <laughs> thing, let me, let me tell you. What's, what is? No, get, let's do a little exercise. What could, what could happen between now and the time they're, they've become 50% of the vehicles on the road? That means that they never become 50%. Okay, right. The Tesla, the Tesla thing. Has that ever happened to an industry before? Where we all knew this industry was going to be the future, and then it wasn't. Oh, which one? Which industry am I thinking of? Guess what's on my mind? It's an energy industry. <coughs> nuclear. Nuclear. Absolutely. I remember the day when nuclear was going to be too cheap to meter. It's just another way of boiling water, and it's going to be so cheap, we'll just give it away. We wouldn't even be worth going out and sending people to read your meters at your homes and things like that. It, energy will be so abundant. And what happened? Event. Three Mile, three mile Island. Island. Now, Three Mile Island, as an event, a catastrophe, released a tiny little bit of radioactivity. I don't, I don't know that there was any, even any sickness, much less fatality, but it so freaked everybody out that it, it put huge regulations on the industry. It became uneconomical. And then, then with climate change and fossil fuels and all of that, it started to come back again, believe it or not, about five years ago. And then what happened? Well, Chernobyl was part of it. No, more recently than Chernobyl was Fukushima. That whole tsunami came and blew away that whole nuclear plant, left the whole area devastated. A lot of people got sick, a lot of people who were killed, etc. Then everybody backed off. So there is an example of a technology which we say, oh, it was it was in the cards, it was coming forward twice, and then it uh, it's backed off. We may never have a, a really large, robust nuclear industry because of that. And the plants today built in the 50s and 60s, and they reached their design life, and they're being decommissioned. So there is no such future that is guaranteed. So we're thinking about alternatives. The right-hand thing, the autonomous vehicle, is expected. It is more probable than any others. But we don't stop there. We say, and yes, but there are possibilities. And there are things in your industry. There are trends in your industry. There are expected futures in your industry that have exactly that same status. Again. Going to work every day, doing your job every day, working towards the expected future every day, and what we all do, I do it. But we're always thinking about what else might actually occur as a Where do the plausible futures begin? This is a picture here. This is a creek. Um, it has a name. It's a little park. You see the kids walking across the creek there. It's a really pretty little setting. You know the name of that creek? Oh, Mississippi River, northern Minnesota, tiny little, you know, you can step on some rocks and walk across the Mississippi River. That's what we mean by weak signals. There are a lot of creeks in northern Minnesota. There are a lot of creeks everywhere that don't become the Mississippi River, but once in a while one of them does. And that's what we call weak signals. They are signals that do not change the future yet, but they're early indicators. And we pay attention to them, even though most of them are not going to change the future. So you get 10 weak signals, nine of them are not going to change the future. But we pay attention to them anyway because, again, we are using a mindset that is preparing for changes that we do not expect. So this is kind of the little early indicators. We had a discussion in the previous session. It was great. Somebody mentioned a survey of millennials. I presume it was a legitimate survey by Gallup Poll or somebody like that, where millennials were choosing preferring 
government solutions and non-capitalistic solutions to health care, education, those kinds of things. Now, is that going to change the country this year or next year? No. Might that, however, be the beginning of a trend that there is going to be a shift in the political atmosphere because of generational change? It's a possibility, and this is the way we think of it. It's a possibility. It's a weak signal that might grow up to be a strong signal. If we are only responding to strong signals, which seems to be the most efficient thing to do, because we don't have time for all this other stuff. If we're only responding to strong signals, then we're always going to be late. It's going to be too late. Now, we're not doing the weak signals because we are preparing for them specifically. We're looking for weak signals to, again, get a habit of mind in that someday our business or our agency or our professional career is going to be in a different era. We don't know what that era is, but we want to be ready for it nevertheless. So we're not doing prediction. We're doing a, a form of calisthenics that gets us ready for change, that makes us flexible and agile and using the present as we can, but also keeping an eye on that horizon. When that stuff comes, starts coming, we're the first people who see it, recognize it, appreciate it, and start using it to our advantage. Futures that don't occur. Is that a waste of time? Obviously, I'm making the case that it's not. Should it be our, I mean, you're not futurist, then you shouldn't be. You got a business, you got a job, you got a, you got a career, whatever. 90 to 95% of your time should be devoted to the present and the near future of that job, that business, that career. Period. 100%, now you got a problem. What you should be considering futures that in the end do not occur. If you talk to a venture capitalist, a venture firm, you say, why do you invest in all those companies that don't make any money? They go out of business. Eight of ten of venture investments do not make the money that were invested in them. Eight out of ten. You wouldn't make it into the major leagues with a batting average like that. One of them breaks even, and one of them is Facebook and pays for the whole. So they are doing the exact same inefficient thing, is that they have to spread out their investments into many losing enterprises in order to get the one. If they said, we're only going to choose the one that we're positive is going to make money, they will never make money. They have to spread it out, and they have to invest. In the majority of their investments, end up not making money. This is the same way. Most of the weak signals that you consider are not going to change the future. Most of the scenarios that you develop, most of the alternative futures, are not going to change the future. Therefore, it seems to be silly to spend any time on them whatsoever. What is true is that the silly thing is not to realize that the expected future is not guaranteed. And some other future, which is yet to be, un which is yet to be known and is unpredictable, but at least we're ready. We're not hanging on with that assumption that this trend future, this expected future, is essentially going to go on forever. Johnson, U.S. Clear Lake, right next to Johnson Space Center. In all of the times that and I've known some astronauts, a few, uh, and I don't think there has ever been a report where astronauts came back from the space station or came back from the space shuttle when they was flying and said, our training was useless. What is that training about? preparing for things, operations, but most of their time is preparing for things that have a low probability of occurrence. Why would they waste all their time? They spend months preparing for every mission. Why would they waste all their time doing that? Because they know the system and they are prepared for change which they don't predict. So this is exactly, this is what airline pilots do in simulators. This is what football teams do when they play against the defense of the other team that they're up against next weekend. You play like them and we'll see. Are they making predictions? No. They're getting used to the flow of the game like that is. So what are scenarios? Scenarios are not saying, oh, there's horse number one, horse number two, horse number three, which one are we going to bet on? No, we're getting used to being in a future which is different from what we have today. Is this a full-time job? No. Is it half your job? No. But if it's not part of your job, then you are leaving yourself at risk, as these astronauts do for up against a situation where you are not prepared to, to, to be able to respond in time to real change that comes about. 
Let me switch quickly to the last two things. Just about all the time. This is my favorite slide here. Unintended consequences. Next time somebody says all we have to do is, you better stop. <laughs> there is always more consequences than what you're saying. The expected consequence is not always the consequence, and of course we've got a lot of examples of that. So, what are we supposed to do with this? Number one, protect a small amount of time to be thinking about these things, talking to other people, reading, having meetings, off-sites, whatever. What is happening out there in the world, and what are we going to do about it, and what are some of the possibilities? If we invest that time, we will make a return on an investment. Just like you save a little bit of money, not 50%, not maybe even 10%. You save some for retirement, some for kids' education, all that kind of stuff. That is means that we're preparing for a future, which we're pretty sure is going to happen. I mean, you might die before retirement. I certainly know that doesn't happen, but we prepare for it nevertheless. We should be preparing for the future by investing a small amount of time, and I'm speaking a single digit percent, but intentionally in protected time to be able to do that. Bring in the changes, the weak signals. How many office spaces? We don't have time for that. We're, we're running flat out, trying to meet the demand, trying to do the business. We're spending 120% of the time on today. Well, guess what your return on investment is going to be after that? Nothing. You're going to be exactly where you are today, if not worse. Thinking about this is an investment of time, just like we do an investment of money. The argument about which future is the right future is a futile waste of time. It is not necessary to, uh, to go through that. When that argument starts, it's time to say, wait a minute, all of these futures are plausible. We should be thinking about all of them. In some cases, we might even want to create a contingency plan. Royal Dutch Shell, which really pioneered this stuff in the business world in the 1970s, en envisioned a number of different scenarios for their business in that time period. One of which was that the huge run-up in prices, and we don't think of $40 a barrel as, as a big price today, but from $2 a barrel in the early 70s to 40 at the end of the 70s was a, what is that, a 20x increase. And they said, what if that price collapses? They thought about it and they said, when it collapses, there's going to be a different way of buying and selling oil. Up till then, they made long-term contracts with countries, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and all that. And those contracts were locked in to 250 a barrel over decades. They said there will be emergence of a spot market. People will buy and sell trading of oil like futures, like a stock market. And so, without telling anybody, they created a shale company that was a trading company in 1979. And sure enough, in 1981, when the price collapsed, they pulled that company out of the drawer, started trading oil on the high seas the next day, and beat the other oil companies, making money the year when their assets went down by 50%. That's a contingency plan. We're not going to create a contingency plan for every potential scenario, but most of them are not going to happen. They're not worth that. But that's a return on their investment. Come on. Now, guys. <laughs> Oh, do you plan for this? <laughs> yeah, contingency. I have, an alter I have a contingency plan, which is called the enter key over here. Oops. Well, the computer just crashed. All right. Let me, let, let me. I, these are ones that unfortunately I can't remember. Um, you want to, uh, is everybody back there? Hello? <laughs> So we're just about done with time anyway. The, the purpose of thinking about the future this way. Oh, we are. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was, that was easy. So uh, you're allowed to say, I don't think it's going to happen. It's not. The probability is that it's not. But it could. We're dealing in possibilities here. And again, that we were, we we're taught to deal in possibilities in school. We were taught to deal in facts, in conclusions that are based upon facts. We're not really taught so much to use our imagination. We're not so much to, talk, to, to use what we could happen. 
the English teachers will point out the difference between the indicative mood of language, which is the language of fact, past, present, and future, and the subjunctive mood, the language of possibilities. I wish we had a lot more subjunctive moods in our discussions. This could happen. Oh, don't, get, don't bother me at all. Probably assumptions. An assumption is a belief, somewhat founded but not proven, about how the world works. We don't know that it's true, and most assumptions have an alternative assumption which has some plausibility. The, one of the most faithful use of assumptions that I saw about, I'm sure there are plenty, was a study that LSU did on evacuating New Orleans before Katrina. They completed this study 14 months before Katrina came ashore. On the very first page of the study, they listed six assumptions, which they should do. We all did that. Physics class, what are your assumptions? State your assumptions. We all did that. And they listed those assumptions. The very first assumption was the levees floor. So the fact that they listed that assumption was progress. That was a good thing. What they did not do was say, and what will we do if they don't? And that, now, maybe they thought about that and said, well, that's a catastrophe. We're not going. <laughs> We're not going to go there. We don't have enough money to figure that out. But clearly, they did not critically challenge what will we do if they don't. So listing our assumptions is a good first step. But simply listing the assumption doesn't tell the world what to do. The world's going to do whatever it's going to do. That just changes. That just reduces the uncertainty in our heads. We're going to assume that the stock market will. We're going to assume that the customers will. We're going to assume that the employees will. Well, you can go assume that if you want. The real question is, what are you going to do if that assumption turns out to be otherwise? And you get an alternative future, are you going to be ready for that? So we're, we're trying to, this, this is what I call critical thinking. And you can put, you can put critical, I mean, and ask, scratch a teacher, and that's always in the top three things they want their students to do. Be critical thinkers. Think for yourself. Think, analyze. Do critical thinking. We had, we had a, a teacher workshop in Houston last summer. We had 100 teachers, and we said, how many want your students to be critical thinkers? All I answer. How many are actually teaching a lesson on critical thinking? Three hands. So it's something we really want. But and this thinking about future is intrinsically critical because we are challenging the expected future. We're doing the expected future, which is the trends extrapolated, and then we're challenging it, looking at the assumptions there and requiring our students to think critically about it. Five more things and we're done. Be ready, expect to use the current era, but be ready to move when it's about to change. When those weak signals begin now to come up. Now, that's a, that's a judgment call. Some people are too early, some people are, most people are too late. Getting it right is like trying to time the market, but at least realizing that the present is not going to continue forever. Sooner or later, we are going to have to make some disruptive adjustment. And if we wait too long, it will be too late. Uncertainty. Inherent, and more so than ever because of communication technology, because of the internet and the media and all these things, things popping up out of nowhere all the time. But uncertainty is also the means by which we're going to influence the future. If the future were certain, there's no reason to get out of bed in the morning because it's already determined, you know, then it's done. But the uncertainty is that we have the time and the, and the energy to make some difference not exactly what we want, but we can bend that trajectory towards the future that we want. Leaders. I think there's a huge confusion in language about leadership. We have two definitions of it. One are people whom I call authorities. Authorities are people who have the right and the responsibility to require other people to do certain things. So a policeman on the street is an authority. He's got out of your car, you got to get out of the car. President of a, of a nation, the CEO of a company, a teacher in a classroom, those are authorities. Leaders are those who commit to create significant change. Rarely do they do that by themselves. More or more commonly, they enroll others in a campaign to create significant change. I wish we had more leaders and followers of the leaders that we have. And again, that ought to be taught and we should be thinking of in our, in our businesses, in our, in our companies, in our agencies, what's my opportunity? What, what should I be doing leading 
to create change or finding a person who's, a, who's leading a change and supporting them and doing what I can. Again, business is business. 90% of your job is operations. I'm not taking away from that, but we ought to be adding something. We ought to be leaving our legacy, leaving our mark to how people are. And vision is what we're leading towards. It's a picture of a preferred future. And in that sense, we're doing that. Hi. Can you click her to move your slides? No, we, no. The, he it, said it wasn't working. It so. wasn't. It wasn't. It, the, the computer, actually. No, I got it. It's okay. working now. Thank, you, thank you for that. Making okay. sure you're good to go. <laughs> so we all have a vision, ought to have a vision, of a preferred future. And we should share that vision with other people. You know, it's rare at work that we really talk about that. What are you heading for? What are you doing here? You're earning a job and you're getting your health benefits or whatever. But what's, what, what, what do you leave here? What's your legacy going to be? What is your mark on this company, this, this industry, this business? And I wish more of us had that. I think it would be too much. And finally, it is a sad fact that we tend to overestimate how much we know. We tend to think we know how the world works and what all we need, all we have to do is. And humility is the antidote to that. Be careful. Don't make assumptions. Don't make rash assumptions. Don't make assumptions that put the business or your career at risk. Be careful. Be tentative. Now that doesn't sound very American. You know, we're supposed to charge ahead and be determined and you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, all that kind of stuff. And I presume there are places for that. But we should have, be courageous, and at the same time, humble about what, what, there is a whole version of understanding how the world works, which emphasizes the fact that it is a system now which you can't put in a model. You know, we, uh, Lawrence Klein got the Nobel Prize for putting the economy in a model at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1970s, the huge econometric model, thousands of equations, thousands of variables, everything you can possibly think of. And even that, that's what's called a complicated system. There's a, something called a complex system, which is unpredictable, inherent. And, and how do we deal with a market, with a political situation that is that kind of complex system? The only way you do it is moving forward tentatively, experimenting here, experimenting there, kind of pushing it here, pushing it there, seeing what happens, revising, thinking, working experimentally. It's not very satisfying. There's no roadmap. There's no blueprint. This is what we're going to do three years from now. No, it's doing a little bit now and seeing how that works and doing a little bit later and all that. Now, that's not a pure strategy, but thinking that we're going to be able to come up with a Gantt chart for being successful is also not a pure strategy. It is a combination of both of those. Planning where, we, where we're pretty sure we know the landscape and how things work. But being ready to admit, I don't think we really know what's going on. I don't think we're very good at predicting and forecasting. So those are 10 things. This, this uh, uh, situation is, uh, <laughs> be careful, you don't know as much as you think you do. If you're interested in the presentation, uh, download it there from that. You can use it for non-commercial purposes. I'd love to see you do that. I believe that we should be continually thinking about this in our current agencies, organizations, businesses, and careers. And of course, my, my overriding concern today is that we're in a college, and that college is beginning to take steps and teach a faculty seminar, including uh, the future uh, in Tarrant Tar Tar County in uh, February. It's going to be a very slow process. <clears throat> I'm trying to be humble. <laughs> How do I get into an organization? I've been working with these folks for about 18 months now, so we're getting there. And this is where uh, uh, this is where we should be going. This is a new approach to the future. It has some radically different ways of thinking of what we picked up more or less by osmosis in school and in our previous education. If you take these things seriously, thinking in alternatives, being tentative and working in with complex systems. Uh, looking for weak signals, realizing that there are multiple futures and you act upon that, getting good at being in, in the uncertainty. It's okay, it's good, it's fun, it's, it's inherent. So that's really where I think we're going. I'm not gonna see the end of this mission, <laughs> but I, I felt that having had the, had the uh, good fortune and the absolute total good luck to find myself planted in the one 
the first graduate program for the studies of the future, it's kind of my obligation to try and bring that to you all, to the people who are working today, but even more importantly to our young people. So if you know any educators, or you are an educator, come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about this. Thank you very much. For